So before Sterling, though, you you uh, worked with Kenny Irwin. Yeah. Um, and and uh, Kenny was killed at New Hampshire in a practice crash. Um, and you described that as probably the the worst day of of your professional career. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. I'd gotten a chance to hang around Kenny just yeah. a little bit. Uh, we were both, uh, before he became a cup driver, uh, we were both at Andy Hillenberg's driving school the same day. Really? We'd been invited to go over there. Jeff Gordon was kind of a bit of a mentor for Kenny, I guess, at some point. Uh, at least as Kenny was sort of looking into NASCAR and stock cars, he was getting some advice from, from Jeff because Jeff had kind of came through the same path. Mm-hmm. And so, anyways, we're, I got told to go over to Andy Hillenberg's. I'm going to drive his cars for a couple of days at a school. They had some regular, you know, they had some school people there, some fans and whatnot doing whatever. Uh, but it was me, Kenny Irwin, and uh, one or two other drivers, um, professional drivers. And I was only 16 or 17. I was driving a street stock car and a Legends car. But, uh, so I got to spend a little bit of time with him there, and then you know, then he comes on into the sport and is trying to get his trying to get his career going. How do you handle that situation? How do you personally keep going? You know, when we go to the racetrack and there's a tragedy, there's an open door to to never coming back. How did you kind of not only keep coming back, but how did you get your program, get everybody together, and uh, try to wrap everybody's brain around what just what you just went through? Well, I was the crew chief and the, the team leader. Right. So it was my responsibility to get to get everybody back together if they wanted to still be a part of it. Um, obviously, again, that was the, the worst day I've ever gone through in my professional career, bar none. I mean, I was a huge Kenny Irwin fan, very huge. I got everybody together, and, and, and we talked through it. And uh, really the best medicine for a racer you have to be at the, it's like a druggie, is you have to be at the racetrack. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you went through your tragedy, you had to go to Rockingham, right? Yeah. You had to get back to the racetrack. Yeah. You know, and and when you mentioned walking away, uh, that would be like suicide to me because I don't have any other life other than racing. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, other than my family, everything I have is at the racetrack. Yeah. All my friends, you know, everything I want to do, my passion, everything. It's at the racetrack, yeah. so I have to be at the racetrack to be, to be a functioning person. How did you deal with your responsibility as a team leader? How did you deal with any kind of you know feeling any responsibility in what happened that day or him driving that car? That's your car, right? Yeah. Um, I know that that I know that you're a human being. I know that you're not insulated from yeah. from feeling sadness, guilt sorrow all the things um so now how do you personally work through that it took a lot of support to be honest with you from from my wife and kids and my dad yeah you know they helped me i was a tough guy at work uh they had they helped me through it when i needed them yeah. and and they they helped me get through that and i'm gonna be honest with you there was never a day when i thought i'm not going to do this anymore but i'm going to be i'm going to tell you this there was there were a few weeks after that that I could go to the racetrack and I could not watch my car go into the corner. Man. Mm. When it went by on the straightaway, I had to focus on that. I couldn't look. Uh, I yeah. remember going to Indy and testing, and everybody gets out. You know, everybody gets out near the near the wall and stands and watches their car come by. I could watch him come at me, yeah. but when he went off in turn one, I kept looking at turn four. Uh, who in the industry put their arm around you? Mike Helton. Mm. No kidding. Yep. Wow. That don't surprise me. Tony, what what about Kenny Irwin uh, won you over so well? We don't know. I, I personally don't know uh, uh, much about him. Yeah. And and I but but the people that were around him are such big advocates yeah. for, for him, both as a talent and uh, as a person. But I, you know, what what was it about him? You know, I I don't know. That's a good question. But there will there will be people I know, and I know you'll think of them. There will be people that you'll be like, man. All right, if I, if I'm going to go somewhere tonight, who do I want to hang out with? He was that guy that you wanted to, hey, you want to go do this? Yeah, let's go do that. Well, somebody else asked you, hey, you want to go? To, nah, I don't feel like it tonight. You know, he was just a guy that uh, you just wanted to go hang out with. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. 
that's pretty interesting, man. I mean, Mike Helton's a pretty uh, influential person in my life, too. And yes, sir. I used to compare him to Dad in a way that he would change the room when he walked into it. And there's only a few people that have that type of ability. And he is the kind of guy, too, that has – he can be that – he the person he was for you in that moment, he's that person for so many people yeah. at, at the same time. I yeah. don't know how he has – you know, I got enough going on in my own life yeah. that I don't even, I don't even know how he finds the time to be that for other people. Um, but it's pretty, uh, it's pretty apparent that he is a special individual. So, Sterling, who who do you when do you think was what do you think was the the heyday for you when you were Ganassi? What was what what was peak? Well, I guess a couple of different stints. I know, uh, I know we'd won in '99. We won Loudon with Joe, yeah. and in 2000 we didn't have a very good year. Obviously, losing Kenny, but we didn't perform on the racetrack like we wanted to. And then Chip come on, and uh, and brought Andy Graves with him. Mm-hmm. And me and Andy were team managers. That was like a big inspiration for me because I was looking for all this technology to come in. You know, all I'd heard about Chip Ganassi Racing was being engineer-driven, you know, and I'm like, okay, they're going to, I'm going to really learn a lot here, and we're going to learn how to be better racers and build better cars and, and all this stuff. And immediately, me and Andy hit it off, like, really, really good. Mm-hmm. And uh, he he did his deal, I did my deal, and... You know, he had responsibilities, and I had responsibilities, and 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 it worked. It worked really good. But Chip brought a lot more resources in. We were able to, you know, build a lot more new cars. You know, with the support of Dodge, that was a big deal. And you know, getting getting motors from Ernie, uh, from Ernie Elliott, uh, okay. just just everything was like, wow, this is this is really good. And uh, I know the first time we went and tested, we had taken a Ford that we had built as a test car at Sabco, and we converted it into a Dodge and uh, went and tested with a Ford motor at Charlotte. Mm-hmm. And and Starlin's like, wow, this this is going to be fun. And um, we actually, I think we won the 125 with Starlin that year in really Ganassi's first race. Um, so, no, that was uh, that was a good period in 01 and 02. Yeah. I think we won five races those two years, and... In 01, we finished third in points. And actually, in 01, if they had the chase in 01, Sterling would have won a championship. Right. Because he got the most the most points during chase mm-hmm. the chase round. And in 02, obviously, he led the points for the whole year, or for three-fourths of the year, he broke his neck. So those, those two years were good. Did you like that conversation with Tony Glover? Well, y'all listen to the entire interview because the Dell Jr. Download is available on all major podcast platforms.